This is From Our Neurons to Yours, a podcast from the Wu Tsai Neurosciences Institute at Stanford University. On this show, we crisscross scientific disciplines to bring you to the frontiers of brain science. I'm your host, Nicholas Weiler. Here's the sound we created to introduce today's topic. Your gut, the second brain. You may have heard the idea that the gut is the second brain, but what does that really mean? Maybe it has to do with the fact that there are something like 100 to 600 million neurons in your gut. That's a lot of neurons. That's about as many as you'd find in the brain of, say, a fruit bat, or an ostrich, or a Yorkshire terrier. To learn more about this fascinating second brain, we spoke with Julia Kaltschmidt, who's a Wusai Neurosciences Institute faculty scholar and an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford. Yeah, so the second brain really is a network of nerve cells that line the gut, or also called the gastrointestinal tract. And this network is also called the enteric nervous system. And enteric really means just sort of relating or occurring in the gut. And this neural network is so similar to our first brain that it's been coined the second brain. And I think the term was coined, I I actually looked it up, in 1996 by Mike Gershon. And just to tell you a little bit about Mike Gershon, Mike Gershon is uh, really, I think, one of the fathers of this field of gastroenterology. He, He actually wrote a book, The Second Brain, and it actually has a subtitle, which is called Your Gut Has a Mind of Its Own. I highly recommend that book. So I believe it's him who coined the term second brain. So one thing that you said is that this enteric nervous system, the the nervous system in the gut, is really similar to our first brain, the brain in our skulls. Can you mm-hmm. tell me a little bit about you know, how it is similar and how it is different? Sure. So let's, let's talk about similarities first. Um, well, first of all, it's extensive. Um, it has, as we talked about earlier, more than 100 million nerve cells. These nerve cells reside within two layers along the entire gastrointestinal tract. Um, so from the esophagus um, to the rectum. In fact, actually, you know, a lot of people, I think, think about the enteric nervous system as being a simpler system. Uh, but just for comparison, it has many more neurons than the spinal cord. Another reason why it's actually similar is, is that if you think about neural cell types, like a sensor neuron that senses or a motor neuron that projects muscles, the enteric nervous system also has sensor neurons and motor neurons. The first brain has sort of signal molecules that we call neurotransmitters. Again, the enteric nervous system also has neurotransmitters. In fact, it has over 30 different ones. And finally, the enteric nervous system or the second brain can operate independently uh, of the first brain. So we can remove the gut from a mouse and can keep it in a medium that um, allows the cells to survive and the tissue to survive. And we can actually uh, visualize the uh, functioning of the gut, the paracelsus, in a dish. So Really, the enteric nervous system is what we call a self-sustained or autonomous system. Okay, so it's self-sustained. It's got so many of the same kinds of neurons as in the brain. It's got lots of neurons. It uses neurotransmitters like the brain does. I mean, when I think of the brain, I'm just going to push back on this a little bit and, and sort of hear how this term is useful or how people should think about this. You know, when I think of a brain, I think of like a centralized thing that does computations and is involved maybe in thinking or decision making. So when we talk about the gut as the second brain, is it involved in those kinds of high level things? So that's a, a really interesting question. I think there are some easy answers and some more difficult answers. Can I, uh, if I may go to the differences first? And so sure. then I think that gets me then to answering that question. So if you think about the differences, right, clearly location, uh, we have the skull versus the abdominal cavity, and then we get to function, right? Because we think about the first brain and as, as for example, controlling voluntary movements or decisions, right? However, the functions of the second brain are different. When we think of the gut, and this is what the enteric nervous system does, it controls digestion. There are sort of there are enzymes that are released to digest food, controls the uptake of nutrients, and then 
doing muscle contractions and mechanical mixing. But what it really doesn't do is generate sort of a conscious thought process as we think of it. However, the one thing that it can do is that it can communicate between the gut and the brain um, and actually vice versa also from the brain to the gut. So there are these nerves that run between sort of the base of the brain and the gut. Uh, it's called the vagus nerve. And you can think of it as like a street or maybe more as a highway because the, the signals are really fast. Why is, it, why is it useful to think of the enteric nervous system as a second brain? So there are a couple of thoughts that, that come to mind. So when you think about the microbiome that you mentioned before, these are, of course, these trillions of bacteria and microbes that, that live in our gut. And you have to imagine they reside really closely to the nerve cells that I described that reside within the sort of the muscle wall of the gut. Their proximity allows for them to receive signals from the cells or to give signals to the cells. And so I think the research efforts that are currently going on in the field of the sort of microbiome and the gut brain axis are really important to try to understand how the microbiome or how the bacteria in our gut can influence our mind or our mood. This is an example of how researching or understanding the enteric nervous system and the close associated microbiome are important for our understanding and well-being of the mind. Another point to consider when thinking about the crosstalk between the gut and the brain is that gastrointestinal issues such as gastrointestinal dysfunction is very tightly associated with neurological diseases. Um, so for example, Parkinson's disease or autism spectrum disorder, individuals with these diseases oftentimes have colonic dysmotility um, or constipation. And in fact, when you think about Parkinson's disease, a lot of times constipation precedes the motor symptoms that occur in Parkinson's disease. So there's clearly a very close sort of correlation of gut dysfunction and neurological um, diseases. Another example is thinking about generalized anxiety. Um, 60% of individuals with generalized anxiety have irritable bowel syndrome. And again, there, we don't fully understand the link but there's evidence that sort of an irritated bowel or a dysfunctional bowel um, might signal to the brain and then that these signals might be responsible in any sort of mood changes uh, that might occur. So when you think about the entire nervous system, it's clearly it's not going to provide conscious thought processes, but it definitely appears to influence our mind. Well, that was something I was going to ask you about, you know, it may maybe maybe the second brain in our gut is is not thinking per se. It's not uh, a separate mind. <laughs> that would be odd. Right. But is it something that we that we can think about like part of our conscious experience? How do we experience this second gut? Is this nervous system part of our conscious experience in the way that say the all of the sensory nerves in our skin and peripheral nervous system that affects us from day to day? And people are trying to think more about the mind as sort of a whole body phenomenon, not just, you know, a pair of eyes sitting in the skull. So is there is there an experience that we're getting from this uh, enteric nervous system? I would certainly think so, yes. Something that comes to mind, actually, by thinking about an answer for that is, to me, when you think about language, when you're excited, this, this sort of saying butterflies in my stomach, or, you know, you have a gut reaction to something. Those sayings, you know, the fact that actually the sort of the gut became integrated in our language describing decisions, to me, is really telling. It's going to be very interesting to see how the gut influences our decisions. I've seen people write, and I'm curious to know if you if you buy some of this, I mean, I've seen people write about the, the enteric nervous system being involved not only in normal GI issues, digestion and so on, but also influencing emotional affect, motivation, intuition, decision-making. Is that going too far? Do we know how much the enteric nervous system is influencing these things? You talked about anxiety, for example. I, I think this is a hard question to answer because you know I could imagine that, that it would influence this. And clearly with the sort of generalized anxiety, there are thoughts that it is actually something that the gut or the enteric nervous system or the signals that derive from them um, affect um, our mood. So with that example, I'd say, yes, the enteric nervous system is able to um, influence our mind and our decisions. I wonder if you could, I liked your description before. Can you just describe one more time sort of how this nervous system is organized? Okay, yes. I'm personally super interested in the organization of the enteric nervous system because until now, there's actually sort of a question of whether the enteric nervous system is organized. So what we do know clearly is, is that it resides within the 
uh, entire length of the GI tract. It is localized within two sheets. And actually, it's these, these neuronal sheets are intercalated between muscle layers. And we've been very interested to see whether the neurons themselves are organized within these sheets, right? Or whether they are different, for example, when you think about the small intestine versus the colon. Because when you think, for example, about different brain regions, uh, there are different neural subtypes in different brain regions. They are differently organized. Um, and so we've been wondering whether there are sort of similarities in sort of associating organization to function. And it turns out that neurons in the gut are organized into rings. Um, and so you can imagine that there are uh, these stacks of rings along your GI tract. Um, and they're different whether you're looking in the proximal region of the colon or the small intestine. And we think that there's a significance to the organization into these rings because that happens shortly off before and during birth. And it's you know exciting to think about whether the organization plays a role or influences the um, establishment of function. I guess I'm still I'm still having a little bit of trouble seeing this as a second brain, other than the fact that it has a lot of neurons and is in communication with the brain. So, okay, what are the similarities between the brain and the enteric nervous system? One of them that we talked about is that it's an extensive system. It has 100 million nerve cells. The brain has clearly a lot more cells. I think it's in the 90 billion nerve cells, uh, but it has a lot, a lot more than the spinal cord. The neurons are forming a network so they are signaling to each other. The same happens in the brain. And if you think about the different neural subtypes that you can find in the brain, they can be defined, for example, by their interconnectivity, their function, their you know, expression of different neurotransmitters. The same happens in the enteric nervous system. So we have different cell types, um, and they're classified to be sensory neurons, motor neurons, interneurons. And they have been shown to produce different neurotransmitters. It's not exactly the same um, sort of co-expression potentially of neurotransmitters, but we have 30 different neurotransmitters in the enteric nervous system. So the building blocks that make up the brain also make up the enteric nervous system. And again, the fact I think personally, the fact that it's sort of a system that can function by its own, right? It can create paracelsis on its own without the brain, I think is, is significant. That's great. Thank you. I have one more question. Can you tell me, I mean, to you, what are some of the most exciting open questions in this field that we don't know yet and that you're excited to find out more about? I think, I mean, to me, what we'd love to do is to sort of understand how the enteric nervous system is organized and how this organization contributes to function. I think it'll be extremely interesting, you know, for the field to understand how, for example, the microbiome influences potentially the enteric nervous system and hence also then via that, the, you know, the signaling to the brain. I think there's a huge sort of um, possibility and opportunity for neurological diseases which are um, currently treated in the brain to potentially be having a different access via the gut, uh, via the enteric nervous system. I also think that we don't know very much about understanding the early onset of the functioning of the gut at all. So I think personally, I think that's a super exciting question. Well, it sounds like a really exciting place to be working right now. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time and, and speaking with us. Thank you, Vic, for having me. I enjoyed speaking with you. Thanks so much again to our guest, Julia Kaltschmidt. To learn more, check out the Wu Tsai Neurosciences Institute at neuroscience.stanford.edu. For more info about Julia's work, check out the links in the show notes. This episode was produced by Michael Osborne, with production assistance by Morgan Honecker and Christian Heigus. I'm your host, Nicholas Weiler. <laughs>